Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Andrea, and I work on the marketing team here at The Strand. We're very happy to have everyone here with us tonight. But before we launch into our discussion with Emily Lesbaum, I'd just like to share a little bit about The Strand's history. Um, the Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Asher Place, Book Row gradually dwindled, dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We wanna thank you all for your support because without our community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Also, we're celebrating today our grand reopening since closing three months ago. So if you're in the area, we hope that you can visit. Tonight, we have, are excited to have Emily Nussbaum, who is celebrating the paperback release of her novel, I Like to Watch, Arguing My Way Through the TV Revolution. Emily will be joined in conversation by A.O. Scott. Emily has written for The New Yorker since 2011. She is the winner of the 2014 National Magazine Award for Column and Commentary and the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Criticism. Previously, she was the TV critic and editor for the Culture Pages, Culture Pages of New York Magazine. Thus, Baum has written a regular column for the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times and for Slate, and she's a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, Nerve, and Lingua Franca. Emily is joined tonight by A.O. Scott. As a child, A.O. Scott dreamed of being a rock critic. After dropping out of graduate school, he worked as a book critic and accidentally became film critic of the New York Times when he was hired in 2000. Doubling down on that bizarre decision, his words, not mine, <laughs> the paper named him chief film critic in 2004, a title he currently shares with Magnola Dargis. Mr. Scott has contributed to the dabble, dabbling in literary criticism for the book review and occasionally other publications and writes for the Times Magazine whenever he can. He makes frequent appearances on radio and television, especially during Oscar season. In 2013, he returned to academia after a long hiatus and is currently a distinguished professor, professor of film criticism at Wesleyan University. He lectures widely on film and especially on the importance of criticism, which is the subject of his book, Better Living Through Criticism. When he is not watching movies or listening to music, Mr. Scott spends most of his time in Brooklyn and on a small island off from the coast of Maine, cooking and enjoying the company of his wife, their two mostly grown children, and their dog. Now, without further ado, Emily Nussbaum and A.O. Scott. There you are. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, um, I just want to, <laughs> I want to break it. Thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to clarify two things. One of them, this is definitely not a novel. <laughs> so nobody should buy it expecting a novel. It would be very dangerous. Um, and, and also, um, I'm, I'm, at the, I'm at the New Yorker magazine and, and have been there for about a decade, but I've, I've done all of those other jobs as well. But I just want to give credit to my place where I'm, where I'm working. And I was the TV critic there for uh, the last nine years, but now I'm, a, um, I'm on leave right now. And then I'm going to be a um, contributing writer when I come back. Sorry, I just wanted to, to weigh in on that. I was very happy to hear Lingua Franca in your bio, though, yeah. um, a, uh, a, a long defunct and much lamented magazine um, where, uh, where you and I first met in, uh, I don't know, many, many years ago. And yes, um, at a large where, garden. Uh, <laughs> where, I was an, where I was an editor and I, I even edited uh, one or two of your pieces. Anyway. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, and to have the chance to talk with you about this this book and to all of you out here, out there, um, who I who I can't see. Uh, if you haven't read it already, um, I urge you to because it's really uh, an extraordinary um, work of criticism. It's it's an argument about the history of television, about the future of television. Um, it it for me, I think, um, is just one of the best books of criticism I've read in in. In, a, in the last few years. And it fulfills for me what is, is, is the kind of the, the highest function of criticism, which is that a lot of the pieces in here stand up, I think, better than the shows that they're about. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm always happy to reread you on some of these shows. Like, for example, um, you're, you're just, you're, you're brilliant um, and, and kind of surgical takedown of, of True Detective. Um, a show I have no interest in ever watching again, but I would read your essay on it, you know, um, 
once once or twice a year just for the for the pleasure of it um and uh so i thought um there's so much there's so much to talk about in the book and and around the book because obviously television is a medium and art form um that continues to to change and to expand um and to affect our our lives and and reflect our culture in all kinds of different ways um so I want to talk about some of the the, the ways that that's happened um, since you you wrote the, the the pieces and collected them in the book, but um, but I also want to kind of trace the the the, the history that's in the book because this really is a kind of a, a, a series of snapshots of the last twenty years or so um, of of television uh, in a way that is both very public in terms of it's, it's about the shows that we that many of us have have watched and watched together um, and and that that reflect the culture we all share but it's also very personal it's about your responses to and feelings about and changing thoughts about those shows so um, I thought maybe we could begin at, at the beginning um, with uh, what what you describe as kind of the the, the the seismic event in your in your critical life, the thing that kind of got you um, on the path toward writing about television, um, which is Buffy the ba Vampire Slayer. Yeah, it's true. I, uh, the opening essay in the book, this is a strange process of going back and thinking, what caused me to want to do what I'm doing? And it's odd to say that there's a specific show in that way, but I don't know whether you have this with movies, but I find with TV critics, TV critics often have a backstory show that was the show that caused them to want to write about television. And, and for me, it was Buffy, which uh, I watched long before I was writing about TV, but I talked about nonstop at the time. I became kind of a super fan of the show in a way that I hadn't been with any other kind of uh, art or culture thing. And um, what I talk about in that opening chapter is the fact that um, it, it became a kind of evangelical thing for me where I was talking about it and at the point that the show was out, it had a fan group, but it was looked down on um, as a little bit of like a teen show, like a fun thing. And at the same time, The Sopranos, also one of my favorite shows, was reaching its height um, where it was being acclaimed by the New York Times every day as something that was basically uh, not just an amazing television show, but better than television. And that was the moment at which I was talking to a lot of people around me. I was in graduate school at the time um, about these shows. And I was so frustrated by what seemed to me to be the completely different set of assumptions that people had about the value of these shows that it sort of lit a spark in me. And part of what I talk about in the book is the fact that that argument about um, the nature of television and what kind of television deserves to be talked about thoughtfully, it kind of runs through the book. Um, but I think TV has changed a lot during the time that I've been writing about it. And that's one of the odd things about putting together this book is I was, I'm both tracing the origins of that argument in that Buffy is a show that people think of very much as a TV show and The Sopranos was a show that people thought of as transcending television. And those categories are a little different right now. I feel like we've really passed into a different period than that initial spark. It, it's interesting. I mean, I, I was just, if, if, if I can just quote um, a, a, a section of that first chapter that I think puts what you just said um, uh, very kind of centrally sort of sets up the argument of the book. You, you say, when I proselytized for Buffy or debate, debated my fellow graduate students about sex in the city, the fight felt like a way to hash out other questions, questions of values, which were embedded and often hidden in questions of aesthetics. Centrally, these were arguments about whose stories carried weight, about what kind of creativity counted as ambitious, and about who, which characters, which creators, and also which audience members deserved attention. What kind of person got to be a genius? Whose story counted as universal? Which type of art has had staying power? And it, it seems to me in a way that list of questions and that, and that frame describes a lot of what has happened in television and in the discourse of television and and in in a way what what emerges through these essays is that you as a critic are posing these questions at the same time that the medium itself is in a way struggling with or grappling with um with these questions and, and also, and, also yeah, just right. the medium itself like exploding and transforming as as it changes 
aesthetically, in the sheer amount of TV, in the way people watch TV, in the fact that, you know, when I was first watching Buffy, and I talk about this in the opening chapter, I was watching it on a big console across the room that I had a remote control that I had lost for. And when I wanted to get some uh, copies of, of episodes that had been, uh, that, that had actually not been shown on the air um, because they were canceled because of Columbine, this episode Earshot, I literally wrote to somebody on the internet and they sent me a packet of uh, VCR tapes. Like the technology was totally different. So when, when you're talking about the changes in responses to those questions, they're also have been affected by the way that people take in TV um, because at a certain point, uh, it's just, it, it, the question of like what counts as a TV show has changed now that everybody's watching on their phone, you can pause everything, you can pull it up at any time. I mean, it's just a different conversation. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, it, and it's, it's gone through so many, it was just, just when I was rereading um, that, that first chapter and, and, and some of the, the, the earlier essays too, just thinking about how many different changes and cycles we've we've gone through because there was you know you talk about something that i had forgotten existed which was the thing that supposedly revolutionized everything which was tivo yeah like i i i i, I forgot that that was ever like well the embarrassing thing was a, a cover story in the times magazine i think about how tivo was destroying television and now i don't know if if my kids actually know what tivo was Okay, well, first, the embarrassing thing is I still have a TiVo. That's the really humiliating thing. I have whatever late stage degraded version of TiVo. It's like a nightmare. I obviously have to switch this, but it's been working for me for a while. So that's what I use. Um, but I, I remember I was an early adopter on TiVo, though. And I have these two things about TiVo. One of them was that, I know, again, a D, TiVo is a, like early origin DVR. It was the first brand of DVR. That's all it is. It's like, is it a normal Are thing? Are you kids for, out there who don't? It's a normal thing to use to watch TV. Is like you save things on a, you know, a digital platform on which you can search for. That just didn't exist before this. So it seemed like a miracle. But I remember when I first got it, the algorithm that chooses other shows to record in the free space was very unnerving to me because I realized it was judging me by my taste. And actually, one thing I remember was I was recording Buffy. So it felt that meant that I wanted to watch Kung Fu movies. So it would tape those. Like there was a lot of stuff where it would, and I was like, wait, what is it? What is causing certain things to come up? And HBO was running G-String Divas, which was this, you know, sleazy, but documentary style study of strippers, right. which I enjoyed. And I liked the show, but I remember that I didn't want to tell it that I wanted to record the show because I didn't know what other shows it was going to give me. And then I'm just going to tell one other TiVo story before we get to like actually substantive things, because it is very funny to me that, you know, anybody who's a little bit older now has all these weird technology nostalgia stories. And so, but when TiVo came out, um, I was asked, I think I'd written a little bit about TV for Nerve or something. And for some reason, I was asked by a Canadian television station to do like, a, a, they were going to do a little unit or I don't know what they're called, like a little segment on, on TiVo. So they asked me whether they could come over, but actually my TV broke or something. So I asked my brother if I could go over to his place and they were going to use the TiVo in order to sort of demonstrate the TiVo. And I got onto my brother's TiVo. Just suffice it to say, he had a different selection of shows that I had chosen. <laughs> um, and and there was a, it, was, it was one of those things where it was like, Vice, I think, didn't exist at the time. But you know, it was like that, and it was like home brewing. It was just a very unusual selection of, of, of shows. And I, I realized that I was going to be appearing on the air, like popping through these shows, and it was going to say something about my taste. So anyway, it, it just, it's a strange thing about that, because TV, when we were growing up, was not only something that you didn't save and record and keep as a text and share with others online, but it was just a solitary viewing experience that came through not literally live, but you know, you'd watch it live and then right. you'd never see it again. And so nope. that is so, th these technological changes are so linked with the aesthetic changes that you can barely talk about one without the other. And honestly, even since the book has come out, there have been, you yes. know, and a, and a constantly rising number of television shows that drives TV critics crazy. So well, and 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 also a kind of a a a, a, a splintering of the medium. So what is? I mean, it it, it was, it, it's great to think about. And 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 I wonder if there's something about the generation that we both belong to that makes this so because because we have lived through, um, you know, the sort of the big console box with with 
three network channels on it through cable, through, you know. Um, you write a version of like, I'm still here and it's nothing yeah. but discussions about yeah. pause buttons. So. But, but, but it is true that, it, that in your book, there is a kind of a nice long historical view that, that embeds um, the, the current issues that you're writing about within the history not only of the medium and the technology, but of but of but of the 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 the, the form. I mean, you go back and you talk about older shows and older forms of um, what what came to look like. You know, sort of the 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 newest and most cutting edge. Yeah. I, I mean, TV history is really important to me, but I don't have a background in TV history. So I had to be a self-educated person on this. And I, I, I think I mentioned this in the book, but when I started at the New Yorker, one of the things I tried to do was actually assign myself essays that would force me to read a tremendous amount of TV history that I was that I knew something about, but not, not deeply. And I have pieces on, in there on Norman Lear, on Joan Rivers, on product, the history of product integration and things like that, that, that actually touch on some of that history because it used to be a big hobby horse for me that I felt like when people talked about television, they didn't talk about it historically. And in order to understand what the medium was, they should stop comparing it to books and to uh, movies all the time and actually talk about it within its own history. That it's one of the arguments of the book is that there was this harmful thing that happened around the turn of the century where in order to make up for the fact that people look down on TV, whenever a TV show was good, they would say, it's so good, it's not TV, it's like a novel. It's not, it's not like TV, it's, it's, it's like a Scorsese movie. And I wanted to you know, put it in the context of TV. But I used to complain that people didn't know the history of TV, but then all the technology changed. So now suddenly people had access to enormous amounts of old TV. So there was this, and honestly, this happened simultaneously with me working on the book to some extent. There, were, there, there was this emergence of archives of television. I mean, people could already watch old TV shows in reruns, but there was this point where like ER became available and a bunch of people were like, yeah, I'm sitting at home binge watching ER, which is this older show. So anyway, I love that because it's well, and, me like and the, the fact the, that people can, can watch stuff from the seventies and get a sense of the development of the medium and what things, what shows responded to what other shows is like a miracle. And, and in that respect, I think it has become a little bit more like other art forms in that there exists a sort of an archive and you can build a library. And the, the, the idea when we were growing up that you would go back and rewatch something, like the whole run of something, it, was, it wasn't technologically possible, but it also would seem insane, you know? Well, I was um, talking to somebody about it, like, because at a certain point there were VCRs, but VCRs were so hard to read. It's a strange thing about technology that small changes in how yeah. easy it is to use them have massive changes in, in, in the, the mass use of them. And this was a case in which theoretically you could tape something on a VCR tape, but you had to be very devoted to a show to actually do the work. Now you can just pick things up anytime and it really changes the, the connection that people have to a show in, in I think a good way because people have uh, the ability to treat TV as a text is the thing that happens, that they could actually take it apart, rewind, pause, compare it to other people. I was talking to some, I was a nerd, you know, and so I watched um, Monty Python. And when I watched Monty Python, it was before VCRs existed. And one of the reasons Monty Python nerds are so annoying is that they're constantly reciting the sketches. But part of the reason they had to do that was you couldn't watch it in reruns. You could only- Like an oral around. folk tradition that you had you to- You had to just say these off. annoying lines. This is a late parrot. Right, like an SCTV. I was like a comedy person. And so I couldn't suddenly, pick up a, a God, this whole conversation is just like in the old days yeah well we're old emily we're old yes <laughs> but but i want to ask you in a way um i i want to go go back to what you were saying before about sort of your your resistance your impatience with the kind of the lazy habit of saying you know the Wire is great because it's like a Dickens novel or, right. or you know, right. The, the, wire, the wire itself comments on. So it's like. Right, right. Exactly. The Dickensian yeah. In yeah. aspect. But because it seems to me that, that that connects with the idea we were talking about earlier, earlier, that your skepticism of what came to be called prestige TV, the sort right. of, the, you know, the, the, the fancy, difficult, important, um, mostly HBO, but sometimes other where other kind of, you know, dark anti-hero shows and you you 
admire and, and, and write very eloquently about your admiration for a number of those shows, but you don't hold them on the same kind of pedestal. And it seems to me that that's related to your interest in other voices, other audiences Absolutely. in kind of the, 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 the diversity and pluralism um, of that, that, that is the, for you the real energy of the, of the art form in this period. Well, I just think that, you know, it's just one of those things where aesthetic styles, you know, are marked as elevated or degraded often based on who they're associated with. Like, you know, whether they're seen as feminine, whether they're seen as queer, whether they're seen as like, like representative of, uh, like, actually, I was going to raise Jane the Virgin because the, to me, the bookend of of Buffy is is Jane the Virgin, which is a very brightly colored show about a Latino family that's based on telenovelas. And so it's marked with all of these qualities that associate it with teenagers, with women, with non-white people, with people who, um, with, with, with um, archness, with melodrama, with soap opera, which is you know, historically this degraded form. And when I was thinking about writing a book, I ran into a woman and I was just asking her, what do you watch on TV? And she said, you know, silly things like Jane the Virgin. And then I went into the, I was like, no, that's a really like beautiful, smart, humane show. And one of the things about that show has to do with who the perception is as the viewer and also who the heroine of the show is. Um, but it, it's complicated because it, yeah. To me, there's also other categories that are seen as like the lower forms of TV, like often drama is treated as more serious than comedy. That's just like a general thing or sci-fi and speculative fiction and fantasy are treated as junk compared to realistic stuff. I mean, a lot of these, some of these things have to do with identity and the identity of who is telling the story and who gets to tell a story. Um, and, you know, I have profiles in the book as well. I have a a profile of Genji Cohen. I have a profile of uh, Kenya Barris during the, I think the second season of Blackish when he was making it, and a profile of, uh, of Ryan Murphy. And I just, those were just profiles that I wrote for The New Yorker, but each of them is working with material and genres that they know and, and kind of have a complicated chip on their shoulder about are treated as like the lesser forms of TV. And again, some of those things have to do with identity, but some of them don't. Like some of them are like network versus cable. And right. part of the mission of the book is not to invert things and say a network sitcom is therefore better than you know a serious cable drama. That's not true at all. It's actually to treat each type of television with a, a thoughtfulness that doesn't just give a gut reaction and say, that's junk, that's serious. My theory about this is that a lot of this has to do with the way that people treated television as a medium in those early years, which was not as an art form, but as a kind of addictive, dangerous, dumb, mass commercial form, which to a certain extent it was. That's, that, that has to do with the history of TV. Yeah. But the hangover from that is that in order to praise TV, you have to say it's not TV. So nobody has found, I mean, at this point, people have found, but people had a hard time finding the language to praise things in the language of TV. And yeah, part of that, I think, is decoding those categories. And you know, some of this is taste. There are things that you like and there are things that I like. And I do like a lot of things that are arch and stylized and candied and brightly colored and have a sweet humanity as opposed to cynicism. But I like things on the other side too. I just sort of want want there to be the language to celebrate all of them rather than what I think of as a sort of defensive response to prestige anxiety, you know, which is to only embrace shows that assuage your sense that you're doing something wrong by watching TV. That said, I think a lot of that it has really dissolved during the time that I've been writing about TV. I mean, TV for a, for a variety of different reasons has become so central to cultural conversation that it's, it's not something that people have been able to write off. It's just, it's in a different stage. As a well, yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because one of the things that, that I've observed sort of from, in a way from the other side, it's sort of film, film, film and TV have, have this long history of kind of, um, they're sort of, you know, TV is sometimes the, 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 the stepchild or the, or the, or the step sibling of, of um, of movies, sometimes it's the thing that's gonna that's gonna kill it. Sometimes it's the thing that's gonna save it. But um, 
but it does seem that that in the time that you've been writing, and I think you know partly not uh, under under your influence and under the influence of other critics who who kind of were around at this moment to 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 make these arguments and to kind of explain what was going on um, to 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 watchers there 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 has been a a real shift in the terms of those arguments like that is I yeah, I don't I it's definitely true when I look when I wrote that piece on True Detective it was at the height of the of the to me enormous overpraise for True Detective which <laughs> people were acclaiming as the work of a notorious masterpiece it had to do with all of these things so when I wrote the piece the reason the tone of that piece is so strong is because I was trying to like puncture. Yeah. What was a gas balloon uh, felt to me of overpraise. That's not the case anymore. I don't think people receive stuff in quite the same way now. And and where I mean, what is your sense of of of, of where we're at now? Because I mean, we we've been talking about the networks and cable, and there was you know basic, and and now we're sort of we're in the era of the streaming platforms. Um, Absolutely. And now yeah, there's like change everybody's trying to figure out what is the difference between HBO and HBO Go and HBO Now and HBO Max. And there's- Don't forget Quibi. And there's quit whatever that is. I don't even know. I don't know if it's gonna be, I, that, that would be the, the sort of the most puzzling essay if, if there was if there was a, a Quibi essay. We watch one show, Quibi is its own, own weird running joke. But but yeah, I mean, streaming is obviously, and streaming has been around for a while now, but it, but it is strange because like I remember the first time, and it was basically that year when Netflix switched from sending people DVDs and yeah. suddenly you could get a whole show at once. It was actually pretty shocking. I remember when both um, House of Cards and Orange is the New Black came out and it was this big adjustment because part of my idea about TV and the thing that I was always praising about TV and that I loved about TV is that TV takes place over time and it's so extended and it has this response loop with the audience that seems very different to me from other art forms. So I've written a lot about how when shows take place over years and develop followings, the show ends up responding to the audience and the audience response shapes what happens on the show and the show is sort of made in front of our eyes. And that's been a big thing that I've written about with a lot of shows, streaming altered that. And I really, I have to say it was weird. I found myself realizing it's not as though I'm nostalgic for shows always coming out just once a week at a certain time. But I, I did feel like there was something that really changed in the medium itself when suddenly you would get, uh, it, I mean, when the creators of shows no longer had the feedback from the audience that they normally had halfway through a network season and they produced the whole thing at once. But then I actually found, you know, TV shows still take place over years and years, which is a different kind of commitment as a viewer than right. for a book. Um, and I, I really have found that even on things like Netflix, because there's a break in between the seasons, the seasons tend to be responsive to people's responses. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, it's a more extended version of that same loop. But this, there are all sorts of changes that are really valuable, including, you know, t uh, I talk about these central qualities of TV and one of them is how um, deeply collaborative it is and how difficult it is to write about collaboration versus individual genius. But because, um, uh, you know, technology has gotten less expensive because people can make shows that only have maybe six episodes, there's more potential for people having very much an individual viewpoint that comes through a show. Right. And, you know, it's now become a normal thing to just have a 10 season episode. People expect that. I think that's a huge improvement for storytellers a lot of the time. I mean, there are a lot of other changes. I mean, it's all exciting. It's been, a, I mean, I am not a TV critic right now. I'm on book leave and I'm writing another book, but like, it, I have to say the shows that have come out this year still have startling cool new things. I'm excited about the state of it, even though I'm not keeping up exactly with what new streaming channels and stuff are out there. Um, do, do, do you have, do you have thoughts about, I mean, there, there are two like very recent um, real world uh, phenomena or or events, the sort of the 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 two big ones that that do actually. By the way, I, I got confused for a second because I'm writing a book about reality television, and so you said there are two big real world events, and I was like, the real world. No, not the show. Yes, not 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 Puck or whatever. Um, but uh, I mean, 
one thing that happened when 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 you know the 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 pandemic hit and we were all at home um the 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 relationship to tv um if it was even tv anymore to 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 streaming media um and 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 to video um it it became you know the 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 central cultural fact in a way in everybody's life it was sort of everything that there there was and i wonder how you as a as a recovering tv critic experienced that well i mean i have my own work to do because i have to i'm like trying to be disciplined about doing the research on the thing that i'm doing and i i found it a real pleasure because now i was able to just watch the shows that i wanted to watch which is what I've been doing. But I know a lot of people were saying, wait, I was wishing I had enough time to catch up on these shows and this is not what I meant. Like, because <laughs> literally, I mean, especially during the height of the crisis, everybody's home. I will say that it, it did destroy, I mean, not that Quibi would have been a successful thing anyway, but their model is it's on a phone and each of the episodes is just seven minutes long. It's clearly designed for people commuting or waiting in line or taking a break. Nobody, I mean, some people are, but like, general people have not been commuting or waiting in line. They have a massive free time. I, yeah, and, and don't want to People story. were asking about like, what are you, what are people watching on streaming and during, during, and I don't know, like this is, there've been many crises during the last few years and people like different things. Some people are looking for soothing things and some people are looking for fun, dumb stuff. And it's just, I, I don't think there's been any particular pattern to this, but I've, I've been happy because I still have the screener privilege. So I get a few of the shows in advance, but you, for, for movies, like cause now, I mean, there's been this, there's been this very weird merge between platforms because a bunch of movies now debut through streaming things. And yeah. I know that's really difficult um, for movie critics. Um, well, it's, 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 it's confusing. I mean, in some ways it's not difficult because we don't have to leave the house, but it, it, it does challenge some of our, 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 um, our, our strongly held um, aesthetic dogmas and, and and principles, but it was yes, it was you know to 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 review the new Spike Lee movie, um, which which was was debuted on Netflix, um, you know from from the small screen, from the home screen was um, you know was 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 challenging, was difficult. It had, there had been sort of a prelude to that with with uh, the Irishman last last year. Um, but I wanted to ask you just one last thing um, before we open it up to, to questions, which is sort of about the other kind of major um, real world crisis, um, which is which is the aftermath of the of the killing of George Floyd and, and the um, the the reopening with with great urgency of questions about um, about racial injustice and, and inequality and, and policing. Um, and one of the things that's been really interesting is how there there's been in in various cultural forms a kind of going back and 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 trying to sort of look at um the the prejudices and the and the and the and the blind spots and the ways that these injustices and these problems have been reflected and 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 built into to cultural forms and and genres and one of the big ones has been um the cop show you know, which is which Absolutely. has been such a such a dominant form, and you have you have a, a great essay in here about um, law and order uh, SVU. But but I just wondered if you kind of had thoughts that there, there's a lot in here. That, that there's a, a a major essay in here about Me Too and about gender and about sort of that moment of reckoning with 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 culture and popular culture and and with um, uh, the need to talk about stuff that hadn't been being talked about. Um, and I wonder if you, you have sort of- well, they're, they're On the two different things. First of all, the police show thing is such a huge element of television. And it is one of those startling cultural moments where people, and this really is like the Me Too movement in that way, where you cannot look at things with the same eyes that you looked at them if you accepted them. Like, like shows look different and Cops was canceled like the reality show Cops, which had been running for what, like, you know, two decades or something? Like, it's Forever, really, yeah. you, you know, that's, that's a mainstay of TV. But um, it, before police shows were big on TV for a long time, the main thing that was in primetime were Westerns. And Westerns were law and order shows that were formulaic shows that were about the heroism of uh, of, of, of a different version of cops and were about 
fantasies about the West and were about racist ideas about um, savages and all of that kind of stuff I think is baked into TV. And so then the, the rise of the TV procedural, you just can't talk about TV with it. It's central to it. But it's interesting that a lot of it, it sort of ca has caused people to look with new eyes on shows ranging from shows that actually address this in a lot of ways, including, you know, The Wire. I, you know, I wonder how Homicide looks now. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I think Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a very charming show. It's part of the Mike Schur house. Of, I, I'm sorry, the, he, it's a different guy, though, who's the head of it, and I can't remember his name. But the, one of the things about that show is that is a fantasy show about an enormously racially diverse um, police unit in Brooklyn. And it has occasionally touched on both racism and a little bit on police abuse, but it can't because of the kind of show it is. It's just, it isn't, the language isn't there. There are shows that are on TV that have dealt with these things, but you know, largely insufficiently. The other thing that you were raising is different, which is the, the enormous expansion of black voices on TV within the time that I've been writing about TV is this significant thing. It's not enough. There are, could be lots of other shows, but the amount of shows that have done things that were just never done before in all sorts of different um, genres and perspectives. And that I always talk about this one year when ABC, you know, which is this major network, I think it was, yeah, it was ABC because ABC had all of Shonda Rhimes shows. It had Kenya Barris doing his shows and it also had American Crime. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the guy who did American Crime. And I remember at that time thinking, this is the, this is the thing. Like it's, it's, it, it is the moment that there are three black creators, they have entirely different ideas about what constitutes the way to tell a story. Like, that's what you want, right? Like, is the, is finally to have Black people in charge of the stories, have Black people at the center of the stories, and then also have a variety. So no one person is suddenly being acclaimed as the great Black creator of television. And then that passed. Like, I, I, like all of those people, I mean, it's interesting because Kenya is doing this new show, Black AF, that's on Netflix, right? And a lot of people went over to Netflix. But there's 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 stuff this year that I've watched that I found, you know, when when a culture goes through a crisis, there are shows that feel different when you look at them. And I, I was actually very glad for Michaela Cole. I don't know whether people here have watched Chewing Gum, which was her series that came out. She's a she's a British woman. Um, and it was sort of this dark, dirty, funny, outrageous sex comedy. But the show that she made is this amazing show called um, I May Destroy You. And it's based on an experience that she had with uh, being sexually assaulted. And it has, I mean, it's about all sorts of things, but it is partially about um, her, her, <laughs> Like it's about race and gender. It's about a response to trauma. I mean, it just, it struck me when it came out that I was like, it coming out at this moment feels different than it coming out two years ago. Um, that's just like an example of a show that's out there that I'm basically sticking in there basically because it does speak to these issues, but also it feels interestingly timed in this way. But it's funny, one of the things that always bothers me is that, and this is true for um, a lot of different kinds of activism, there aren't that many TV shows that deal with activism. Like I'm not talking about racial violence, which appears in different forms on various kinds of shows, but there aren't a lot of activists on TV. Like you don't see that much about any kind of activism. I mean, every once in a while you'll see like a special that's about gay activism or a, a little mini series or something like that. Um, but there are exceptions and, and the other one, I'm just throwing shows in there because I feel like these are shows that speak to these issues and they're not quite in the categories that you would think they would be. There's this show called Good Trouble that is a spinoff of, um, uh, a spinoff of The Fosters, the which Fosters, I also enjoyed. Right. And The Fosters was a show that was, it's a show for families. Like it was a show about a biracial lesbian couple with kids that were adopted and biological from different backgrounds. And Good Trouble is set in Los Angeles. And it's a massive plot that's about a Black Lives Matter activist. And it goes so in depth into a lot of those things, but it's a soap opera that I think for a lot of people would never have sought it out as a place to go for information on this, but it's from the perspective of the activists and it's yeah. from the perspective of the mother who lost somebody in a 
horrific act of police violence. Anyway, I'm just raising this because my, my hobby horse is clearly the fact that you don't have to have a grim and gritty trauma drama in order to actually address some of these issues. And I see them coming through in different forms on TV and that's exciting, but it'll be interesting to see the aftermath of this. And there were, you know, Orange is New Black is one of my favorite shows. It, there was enormous debate about the handling of race and violence and police stuff, but I feel like the ambition of that show is to me a model for something that I would love to see on TV is this kind of, you know, wild, aggressive treatment of stuff that isn't, that, that is about telling difficult stories and hopefully more stuff will get green lighted that actually yeah. makes this stuff central to the story. And that it won't be like the period when Orange is the New Black was green lighted where you literally couldn't get that show out in the air. If the numerous black characters on the show had been the main character, it would not have been green lighted. Maybe it would be now. I'm sorry, there was like a long speech about everything from cowboy shows. <laughs> no, that was great. And if I mean, green lighted with main with main characters who are people of color, like it's like yeah, well that was, you know, that was that was that was that was vintage Nussbaum, and that's why everyone needs to to to, to buy the book for more for more of that kind of <laughs> like a manifesto and like a bunch right, of linked, but not totally overlapping issues. <laughs> oh, that was valuable. So but we have some questions coming in. Um you can yes. ask questions uh out there um either in the the Q and A box um, in Zoom, or the the chat box in Zoom, or uh, or on Facebook, um, and a few have come in. Um, and uh, all right, here's 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 a question um, in which I have no stake since it's not a show that I ever watched. But um, someone would like to know: do, Did you watch Game of Thrones? And I know that you 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 wrote a very perceptive uh, piece about the the sort of the um, Game of Thrones as as being an allegory of politics. Um, this person wants to know what did you think of the final season, and more so, what did you think of the fan reaction to the final season? And this, this is a fascinating case of of like a thing that was the most popular thing in the world that suddenly everyone seems to have turned on. Well, that's a true. I mean, look, I was in a good position vis-a-vis -vis Game of Thrones in so far as I watched it. I wrote about it. It wasn't my favorite show. I had problems with it, but I thought it was a well-made show and I got why people were into it. And yeah, I did. I wrote a piece that basically said it was a handy way for people, you know, as art often is, for people to have a tool to talk about politics through these metaphorical characters. How did I feel about the last season? I didn't think the last season was very good. And I thought that, I, I thought there were a lot of cheesy things about the finale, but they're cheesy things that happen on a lot of finales because I think there's enormous pressure on creators of television shows to please their fans. And so it's almost, you know, like 80% of the time they write something that's supposed to provide incredible closure to everybody. And then people get pissed off anyway. So they might as well have done something a little more risky, but people's desire afterwards to demand that they rescind it and <laughs> they get to write it from scratch, I guess on a big shared Google document, probably not realistic. And, but you know, this isn't my first time at this movie. It's like, there have been, I'm, I try to be on the side of the fans. Like I was, I've been part of several fanhoods that were very distressed about the direction of shows. And also I'm an outlier on a lot of finales. Like I didn't like the finale. I, I like, a, I like a lot of Breaking Bad and I was a big fan of that show while it was on the air. But I have this, this theory, which is mine about the finale that I actually do feel is a sort of closure finale that betrays a lot of things about the show. So it's not like I'm immune <laughs> to this, this kind of response. But that said, I, you know, it's funny, when I was originally organizing the book, I almost had it, I, I wanted to have it in a different kind of sections. And I thought I would have a section called finales, because a lot of the pieces that I like the best in the book are actually finale pieces. Like, I have one that's about Sex in the City, that's enormous praise for the show, but talks about the problem of the finale for that show. My Sopranos piece has to be about the finale. Right. Um, and uh, the Lost piece, which is a mean piece about Lost, the show that, you know, yes. like- uh, uh, no, and, and another sort of- uh, I think there's another one too. Like uh, the, the True Detective piece couldn't be about the finale because I wrote it right before the finale, but the finale confirmed my opinion. And I think there are some, I mean, there are also some interesting pieces that, that are in the middle. I mean, like the Americans piece, right, does right. not, is, is, is pre-finale. And that that finale was one that, that I was fascinated by and that I did not 
think was going to be what it was and that um i thought i, I actually loved that finale when I, I read a p i actually read a blog post about that show that i'm very proud of about the finale that god that show was good and it did it, it really was meaningful that they were able to land that plane i've come to this point where i can forgive shows that can't can't quite hit the finale because i feel like tv as an art form like there's something to love about a show that fails at things but is still powerful ambitious and interesting like perfection's great but it's not always the only thing to look for but there was something about there's a lot of things about the finale of the Americans that 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 really work, but it was interesting hearing people's responses to it. Um, because there's that, I mean, we go into the weeds about that big scene between him and uh, right. leaving and about, I wrote this piece that was basically like, this is his final con, you know, I think they're sociopaths. <laughs> um, but it, the, it is a mark of how good that show is that people still want to talk about it so long after, yeah. and I really do miss it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I come back to it. Um, I mean, I got to it late and sort of watched it um, all, all. And because, because of my whole theory about anti-hero shows, I have this particular love for shows that I feel are designed to be responses to and cures for the problem of anti-hero shows. And The Americans is one of those shows because The Americans literally models that you can make a show about murderers and people who do terrible things. And it cannot take all of the shortcuts that just enable people to get off on the show. Right. And then there are all these comedies that are totally responses to anti-heroes like BoJack Horseman, yep. the Andy Daly Show Review. So like, I love this fact, this thing when TV talks back to itself. That's, yeah. that's my, my love. Here's a question um, uh, very much uh, um, in tune with your past interests. And then we have um, one about your current interests. Um, the first one is, do you have thoughts about the murmurings of a Buffy reboot? What do you think that show would look like on contemporary television? My general statement that I always say about reboots is that it reminds, always I say it reminds me of uh, Stephen King's book, Pet Cemetery, where it's like, you know, don't wish for it to come back because it never comes back quite right. <laughs> like there's always something a little off about it. I mean, there have been a lot of reboots that are just they're like zombie versions of the show on the other hand i, I don't remember like there there was a the buffy reboot i remember there was a really interesting creator for it um it a young african-american woman who was working with joss Whedon. i don't know exactly what the outlet was for but i read something that i was like oh that actually sounds kind of encouraging i was surprised to feel that way I do feel like that show feels set in the period in which it's made. And I, part of me is just as I always feel, it's just like, just make another show that has all the same power of that. Like, don't just use those characters. Like, what are, is it grown up versions of the characters? Is it, is it like the Muppet Babies or something? Like, but that said, it's also a series of, of graphic novels and comic books, and there's a whole Buffy verse that goes beyond it. So I, I don't want to write anything off that I haven't seen. And I, I guess I could always hope for it. I'm trying to think if there have been any reboots that I liked because it's like I was not a fan of the Gilmore Girls but I did think it was a bad reboot and then there was the really weird Arrested Development one and um I don't know like I, I just think that it, it's I, not I, I kind of like the 21 Jump Street movies I have to say but the movies are amazing <laughs> they're so good that's, that's a, a reboot but a but a, a, a shift of, of medium so here here's a question um that I think it kind of uh connects to your to your current interests and if you want to talk about what you're working on now um, that's great if not that's okay too um, but the question is how do you feel about the type of person that now goes on reality television it once seemed to attract people that were experimental and went on a lark and now it has been subsumed by the influencer industrial complex <laughs> well the influencer thing first of all the book i'm writing is about early reality television that's the subject of it it's a non-fiction book about the origins of reality TV, but it ends in 2004. So it predates and it kind of overlaps the ending because I've been thinking about like, what are the things that happened in 2004? And one of them was the beginnings of the celebrity thing where they'd use actual stars on TV. And there's a handful of early people that kind of branded themselves, but really, it wasn't something you can do because for one thing, the internet didn't exist and social networking platforms didn't exist. So even if you wanted to be famous for being famous, which some people on early shows were, you actually didn't really have the option to suddenly create like a, 
um, a fashion line very, as easily. Like, I'm not saying it wasn't possible, but I will say, first of all, I, I watched some modern reality stuff, but the, the um, disapproval of people's motives for appearing on reality shows is the most ancient tradition in reality television, <laughs> as is the contention that whatever happened after the thing you like is the, is the sad, pale version of the innocent reality TV that used to exist. And the thing is, this has been going on since the beginning of reality TV. It's so funny because, you know, it's like each show where you go like, you know, American Family or The Real World or the ones at the turn of the century where people go like, that was the only real season of Survivor because people didn't know what Survivor was. Right. And I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying there's something really funny to me about it because there's this kind of mourning for the, the innocence of people's motives. I, I don't know, maybe there are people who go on reality shows now who do go on with this mindset where they're like, this will be an adventure. Maybe I'll learn something about myself and participate in a social experiment. But it does seem like at this point, it's like, you know, in airplane where they're like, they bought their tickets, they knew what they were getting into. I say, <laughs> like, fresh. <laughs> like, the, I think people feel a little bit that, that, that more about it at this point. Here's a, here's a question. Um, uh, a good question, a, a question that I think every every critic gets um, some version of it. Um, uh, the the person wants to know: Do you ever watch television with a Sontagian against interpretation mindset? Reference to Susan Sontag's great essay against interpretation. Um, one of my one of my touchstones uh, as a critic. Or are you always looking for a deeper meaning? Why is it your touchstone? Um, because I, I, I just can't, it just always bothers me. I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's a brilliant essay that seems to me completely wrong. Yeah. Um, Cause I was like that surprised. Cause I was like, I know you're very really interested in Sontag. So, and I, I am not an expert on Sontag at all. So, I mean, I know the general. Well, I think partly, I, I don't want to get into my whole, um, reading, but I, but I think it's, it's, it's an, it's an essay very much kind of, um, in tension with itself that it wants to take a position that it's unable to 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 take. That is, it's an interpretive argument against interpretation. Against interpretation that's just for purely. Yeah. I watch TV for fun, and I don't analyze everything that I watch. And there's stuff that I watch that I think. I I don't think people have to choose between the two things. I mean, a lot of times people ask me a different version of this, which is basically like, can you enjoy things because you're always taking them apart? Like, doesn't that ruin your capacity? For I, I feel like. If you can't, I mean, for one thing, I'm actually not writing criticism right now. Like I left my job as a critic and I'm writing a different kind of book. And when I come back, I'll be writing other things, but I'm sure I'll write critical essays. But I, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think that if you look at something analytically, it doesn't mean that you're not affected by it in a, in a like turned on by it or scared by it or, just passing the time with it. Like, I just, I, I, maybe I'm not answering this right, but like, it's always seemed to me to be like a, a false setup. Um, I, I think I, my, I'm like always a little worried about the, like you're watching it wrong part. Of right, it, right. Which is, which is a big part of how people talk about criticism. But I think too, that, uh, that it, it's a, it's a question that's, that's often a, a, a one that, that critics have trouble with because one of the reasons that we are critics is, is partly that, the pleasure, uh, part of the pleasure of, of, of watching these things or experiencing these, these, is, these doing this. is thinking about them and yeah. is arguing about them and is figuring out what you think about them and, and, and you know, talking with other people about them. Like one of the things I particularly like about TV and that I think is the reason the internet is so central to what's happened with TV is that once the internet existed, you could meet other people who were watching the shows that weren't in your living room and talk about the show for decades. Like to me, that's not like, those are like, like that, that is a pleasurable experience is, is actually doing that as well. But, the, but, but I will say there are, I mean, the one thing I do relate to is there are shows that I don't necessarily think are good shows, but I enjoy watching them because mm -hmm. they provide something, either they're sort of like a safe and soothing experience or they're pretty, <laughs> you know, like they have nice tablecloths. I, I don't know, like there's, there's a, people always watch things for multiple reasons, but I don't feel like I'm in danger of, of being entrapped by some sort of wiry, like inability to, to feel unconscious responses and, and, and forced to analyze everything that I see.
Um, but maybe I'm mistaken about myself because it seems like somebody who had that mindset would probably make an argument <laughs> that they weren't having it. So. All right. Um, me. <laughs> but that's also what you do. I mean, that that's the thing about criticism too, is that, and, and, and I think one of the things that, that, that I, that I like so much about this, this book, as I was saying at the beginning is that it is, it, it, it has a lot of, of information and, and intelligence and, and wisdom and insight about television, but it's also a very personable and conversational um, book. So you can, you can really have the feeling of, a, of, a, of, of your mind and sensibility um, grappling with these. With That's true of your book as well. You know, it's so interesting because Tony wrote this wonderful book that is about criticism as an art form, but it is the one thing that we oddly like I have this I have this inability to talk about criticism as an art form I am always talking about criticism as the uh, um, why do I always forget the word you know where something is preying on another thing like a like parasite a, what para yeah it was like a parasitical relationship to art but I don't think that's a bad thing like I find this like a sad, like it doesn't exist without the thing that it's criticizing and so but but I do think that we share certain values about about what works in criticism and to me criticism is personal voice a seductive theatricality is mm -hmm. is part of it you're reading it in order to hear some person and the critics that i like i often like reading them even if i disagree with them and i like the conversation and i like this quality of tv criticism right now is that there are so many multiple voices many of them not official critics just people talking on discussion boards or talking online and to me that hubbub of discussion is part of criticism and it's also part of fanhood and it's part of what it means to be part of the tv audience so that's not a separation between being a critic and enjoying something and i don't think that part of it that's analyzing it marks it as anything other than just part of the pleasure i think that's a that's a perfect ending point and it's exactly Nine o'clock, um, and and that was uh, an 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 eloquent um, summation of of partly of, of of why this book is uh, is 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 so wonderful. So um, all of you should click on that button and uh, and 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 buy it. Um, if this was a real bookstore event, you could then sign it for them. But um, you should buy it and read it anyway. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Thank yeah, thank you guys both so much. This is a wonderful conversation. I, I wish we could go on. <laughs> um, I think I gotta throw in like TV recommendations because I always... Yeah, go for it. Yes. The Great is also very good. It's not gonna be to everyone's taste, but Elle Fanning is fantastic in it. It's this weird show. I, it's, it was, if people like Dickinson, it's, it's different than that, but it's a similar thing in that it's a youthful, modernized version of uh, a historical thing, but it's very dark and strange and effective. And I really like Mrs. America too. And um, oh, yeah. I May Destroy You, those, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I saw recently that was really, really good. Um, but it's fun to Did watch. you like it. Never Have I Ever? Yes, I love Never Have I Ever. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, you know, I was a big, like the Mindy Project was a mess, you know, but it was consistently funny and she is a really original creator. And this is a really, this is so different because this is a very perfect show, you know, like it was is a masterpiece of the streaming thing because it was really thought through that main performance like that girl was this her first that girl's incredible. So good. And John McEnroe. I mean, and, and the John McEnroe thing is kind of what that yeah, it's just I would love to know what brainstorm session they came up with. That. Yeah, that's a great show. <laughs> All good. I've watched some of them, but now I have more to watch. Yes. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I've linked to both of their books in the chat window. So if you want to click there, you can get them from Strand and support a local independent bookstore and these lovely authors. Um, thank you again. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Great fun. Nice, nice meeting you invisible people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thanks thank for the good question. All right. Bye, have a good night. Bye.